firstly, uh, uh, what a fantastic uh, uh, act, and uh, it's a very tough act to follow. Uh, once again, a big round of applause for Rajkumar. I have to start off with an apology, uh, two apologies. Uh, I've just come back from India uh, and I'm carrying two things. Uh, firstly is a Kejival cough and uh, therefore apologies if I through my next few moments uh, I, I cough a little. Uh, and secondly is uh, the Modi pinstripes. <laughs> I'm not quite sure whether that's an apology or a cheer for those two in the room. But look, uh, I'd like to firstly say uh, thank you very, very much to the uh, Warwick India uh, Forum for inviting me uh, to, to this uh, event. Uh, it's been a very, very long time that I've actually stepped into a, a lecture theatre, and indeed, uh, when I was at uh, university, I rarely stepped into a lecture theatre, so I'm absolutely grateful to Warwick India Forum for giving me uh, this opportunity. And uh, secondly, for uh, uh, the distinguished speaking in front of such distinguished uh, the speakers, uh, Dr. Kiran Bedi, of course, and uh, uh, Dr. Sashi Tharoor, who I wouldn't have dreamt in a million years that I've been speaking in front of, and that too, him devouring a triple chocolate muffin. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much uh, 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 as well. Uh, friends, uh, it's slightly emotional for me that I'm stepping into this uh, uh, auditorium, which is the Brian uh, Shaw uh, Scaven Auditorium. Uh, Brian is somebody that I met uh, uh, a couple of times uh, uh, over the last few years and unfortunately passed away. Uh, but he was a, a fantastic figure within the Midlands, and those of you that have read about his life, somebody who was a, a, a thorough entrepreneur, and somebody, I think, quite relevant to the subject of reconstructing India. Uh, he helped reconstruct the Midlands in, in many ways over, uh, over the years, and therefore uh, I'm that much more delighted to uh, be standing here. I was... Uh, not born in Mumbai or Delhi, I was born in Mosley in Birmingham, so only a few, uh, few miles away uh, from here. And it's quite nostalgic for me that I've been asked to speak on uh, India and UK-India relationship in uh, particular. And uh, nostalgia because almost 25 years ago, uh, when I did attend uh, uh, a lecture theatre, and I still can't believe that you guys are paid to come here on a Saturday. But, um, when India was 1991, when India was uh, opening up uh, to the world, um, some say out of compul uh, compulsion, others say out of conviction, but India started that pro uh, program of economic uh, liberalization and those debates that happened uh, in India and across the world and indeed at the London School of Economics, which is still the best economics uh, uh, faculty in the country, I must say. <laughs> I wasn't expecting any cheers for that. <laughs> um, the debate about Swadeshi versus Videshi, but look, those days uh, were days when I, as a student like, like you, were, were fascinated about uh, what is happening in India and uh, the opening up of the Indian economy, and I decided that for my career as a lawyer, I wanted to engage uh, with India uh, and to see how I could contribute to my motherland and to the growth story that at those 25, year, 25 years ago was on the cusp, what India was on the cusp of. And today, after the last uh, uh, ele national election results, we see that India is again on another phase, another cusp of its uh, uh, economic uh, development. And I only envy all of you in this room that um, we're in a time where the world is changing, India is changing, and you have an opportunity to be part of what I think will be one of the most fantastic growth stories that uh, the world has uh, seen, and indeed, if I were to say, be bold enough to say, has ever seen, and uh, led by a majority government uh, of, of uh, Sri Narendra Modi. I'm going to keep my comments very brief and speak specifically on the uh, UK-India relationship, and 
Uh, the reason why I've chosen that topic is that each one of you have decided to uh, make the UK uh, your home for your education, for maybe for a few uh, more months or a few more years, but um, the UK is your home at this moment in time, and uh, you can look at India from a particular prism. And uh, I just want to see and explore with you in the question and answer session afterwards and your thoughts about how you perceive the UK in your relationship as well. But a few th throwaway comments to begin with. The UK, as many of you will know, is the largest single cumulative investor in India because of historic reasons and indeed it continues to be a major investor into, the United, into India. India conversely has invested more into the United Kingdom than all of the European Union put together. And over the last uh, four or five years, India has continued to be in the top three, four, five countries that are investing into the UK, both in terms of number of new projects, but also in terms of absolute cash value as well. There used to be a time when there were lots and lots of small Indian IT companies, and many of them did very, very well, but it was the number of projects that were measured, but now in absolute cash terms, India is a major investor into this company. So a genuine partnership between the UK and India has emerged. There are so many Indian companies, most of the Indian top companies have got their, uh, their offices in London, and many of them are also listed on the London Stock Exchange. Having said all of that, what depends a lot of all of this is the, uh, the fact that we have a strong and vibrant diaspora in this country, a 1.5 million Indian diaspora, who have made this country uh, not only their home, but a place where they have flourished in all forms uh, of life, from be it education, business, politics, indeed in sport uh, as well. And therefore that bridge between India and the UK uh, is something that is worth to be celebrating and you are all being present here today participating in that uh, great bridge between those two countries. Having said that, having said that, and many of you may have sensed this, and I see this every time I go back to India, that the UK, people say, is somehow slipping in, in, on India's radar. Yes, we accept the historic ties, but there are many other countries in Europe, Germany, France, that are also taking some of that limelight away. Indeed, uh, Prime Minister Modi, it's public knowledge now, will be visiting uh, Germany in, in April, and Paris and Brussels, and not on his first visit, not visiting the United Kingdom. That reason may also be down to the fact that we have elections in this country in May. But it has been seen as perhaps a signal that there are others on the Indian radar that uh, are taking uh, precedence as well. But I think there is something that, and I can say this as a British citizen, as somebody that has been born and brought up in this country, I think that the UK government over the last few years has missed the boat and has missed the message. This is not anything to do with Indian politics, but more to do with the way in which the government in this country has conducted itself. Firstly, David Cameron has been to India now, I think, four times in the last five years. Unprecedented, it's four times uh, in the last five years. An unprecedented number of times for a UK Prime Minister to visit any one country, especially India. And not one reciprocal visit from uh, the Indian Prime Minister. My Mohan Singh hasn't visited, and Mr. Modi has yet to visit uh, as, as well. Secondly, Prime Minister Cameron has uh, had placed, as some of you may remember, over the last four or five years, significant personal capital and political capital over many deals, in particular the fighter jet deal, 
uh, where France has, in effect, won that contract with Raphael as well, whereas Prime Minister Cameron had uh, put a lot of political capital into trying bringing it to the UK consortium. Thirdly, the ambiguity that this particular UK government has created over Europe, the almost what I call the hokey-cokey effect, where are we in Europe, are we out of Europe? India and Indian companies have invested, invested a significant amount of resource and money in London and in the United Kingdom to use the United Kingdom as a launch pad for the rest of Europe. And to now be talking about whether we're going to remain in or out of the European Union is something which I think many Indian companies are quite concerned about. And I believe there are discussions also within the Indian government about what its reaction and its approach would be to a yes no <coughs> referendum as well. And that for you as students and people that may remain in the UK or look for jobs within the European Union as well, perhaps within Indian countries, given the fact that we can continue at this moment in time to enjoy a freedom of movement and freedom of goods and services is something that could be of concern. And finally, uh, the issue of immigration and the ambiguity that has, uh, uh, has emerged over the last few years as to whether or not Indian businesses, Indian students are welcome or not welcome. But I had a contrarian view. Uh, last year I, uh, uh, I was in Chennai and uh, uh, the British High Commissioner, Sir James Bevan, uh, who is a dear friend, uh, started to speak about uh, how the UK is indeed a place where Indian students should feel welcome and Indian business should also feel uh, welcome. And that its immigration policies are those that uh, uh, should be uh, respected and uh, are, are very liberal. The uh, moderator of that session then, at the end of Sir James's speech, turned to a person from Tata and said, um, Sir James has said that uh, the British immigration policy is one that's very, very liberal. Uh, and open to Indian business and students. What do you think? I, like everybody else in the room, would have expected the man from Data to say to complain about the British immigration system. What he actually said was that we have no problems with the UK immigration system. We think it's a fair system. You know, every year there are fifteen thousand odd uh, members of our personnel that come and go from the United Kingdom. Our problem is persuading young Indians like you, like all of you, to come and work in this country. Why would they want to leave India, which is now on the cusp of such a major transformation, where the salaries that you may command in India are those that are comparable, or at least in terms of purchasing power parity, and that are, are significantly higher and why would you want to leave your, uh, your drivers and your maids and all of that, God forbid. And uh, so his was a contrarian argument to the general view and something that I want perhaps to share and listen to maybe a little later on. But I believe uh, the real criticism I have is in terms of the messaging that the UK has sent out to India. Four years ago, David Cameron, he's a nice enough chap, you may think that I detested him, but it's not that quite the case. Um, he said that he wanted to see a special relationship between the UK and India, a special relationship. At that time, and continuously thereafter, I made a point, and I continue to make this point, that it is no longer when you have two equal partners. It is no longer the prerogative of a British Prime Minister to decide whether or not the UK should have a special relationship with India or not. I felt that the greater focus, and you can have many special relationships around the world, and those of you that study international politics, you hear politicians talking about special relationships all the time. What you 
what the UK should have focused on, and I think what India should focus on as well, is to focus on the depth of the relationship. And I would say to you all that there is no deeper relationship in the world than the UK-India relationship because of the politics, because of the history, the language, the legal system, the financial systems, and the fact that we have the largest diaspora per capita and those bridge builders that we have. And therefore, the real messaging should be to focus on the depth of the relationship rather than a special relationship that is here today and God tomorrow, because depth is something that will never be taken away. Secondly, I believe that, that this country has treated uh, uh, a lot of its uh, Indian diaspora politicians, and there are many of them, as trophies. Not, despite all of these years, though there has been a Pakistani, and I took the point on board about the love affair between Indians and Pakistanis, but there has been a Pakistani origin cabinet minister, but despite the large number of Indians uh, in, in uh, the um, political scene, not one has been selected by David Cameron to serve in the British uh, uh, cabinet. And generally there's been a feeling that Indians are there more for votes as opposed to the relationship and uh, uh, a point in case has been the uh, timing of the Gandhi statue. What a wonderful wonderful gesture it is, but there is a cynicism that perhaps this is something more to do with the 25 to 30 odd seats that uh, could be won or lost at the next elections in this country because of, because of the diaspora vote. And I hope all of you, I think, as uh, students are allowed to vote in this country, I hope you all can vote and will exercise your franchise as well. So how can this uh, perception or this situation be rectified? I believe, like I felt 25 years ago or so ago, that the people in this room, the students today, have the real opportunity to be the drivers of this particular relationship, as those that have been studied and benefited from this English uh, education, which is still the most fantastic education uh, system. I think the opportunity that each one of us has is to start to talk about ensuring that countries like the UK squarely align themselves behind India's growth story. And in aligning themselves squarely behind India's growth story, countries like the United Kingdom have everything to gain and nothing to lose. I'll talk you through five examples very quickly. One is the Prime Minister's Make in India campaign, and you can start to see the fruits of that with company after company that had previously only sold into India is now looking to manufacture into India. During the election campaign, the, um, the polls and the internal polling that we saw, the key issue was jobs, jobs, and jobs, and the creation of jobs, and therefore Make it in there is something that we must make sure that uh, succeeds. But countries around the world, especially Western countries, and you've seen this in the US as well, that are worried about that because they fear that a job to India is a job lost to the UK or a job lost to the USA. My contention is a job to India is always going to be a job to India because that's the way in which economics are going to work. But it allows countries like the UK to come up, the, uh, com increase their competitive advantage by focusing on various technology developments and focusing on their strengths, and therefore increasing their global competitiveness by partnering with India rather than trying to uh, somehow live in a fanciful land where they can still resist jobs traveling to countries such as India. And secondly, let's accept that in India, over the years, there has been manufacturing, but an issue has been quality. I remember growing up where there used to be in India, uh, and every time I visited, I found this really odd, you'd have uh, mango pulp, and then you have export quality mango pulp. <laughs> what on earth is all that about? <coughs> quality was for abroad, quality was not for Indians at home. That was a pathetic situation, and that's something that we need to rectify. And I think in this 
country in this room, some of you will be studying, having sessions on quality, and the UK has been known and is known for its focus on quality in various manufacturing products and services, and something that perhaps <coughs> you can take back into the jobs and when, if and when you go back to India is something that you should look at uh, as well. Secondly, Skill India and the education, the, the, the real deficit in terms of education and then skills is something that the UK, I believe, has mastered pretty well in terms of its programs of continuing education and learning and continuing to upskill its workforce. And is there something that we can learn from here? And standing here in, uh, at Warwick University and jokes about the LSE in Warwick to one side, we have a fantastic example in the Warwick Manufacturing Group, a group uh, that has come out uh, of, spun out of uh, Warwick University, and that real, real uh, partnership between the university and the corporate world, that somehow, I think, is a lesson for India which is something that needs to be learned pretty quickly and uh, your time at this university maybe I would hope that you could look at these types of models uh, and, and see how India could benefit uh, as well. So life sciences and biotechnology, a field which uh, I have come into contact recently, I, I'm on the board of a, uh, an antibiotics drugs discovery company and I'll tell you a little story about how I got involved in you know, uh, it's, you know, science and is not a, my field, but um, uh, a UK company called Health and Therapeutics, um, which is headed by Sir Anthony Coates, the world's leading microbiologist, approached me. And they said that, look, we're, we're looking at raising £20 million uh, to fund some clinical trials to take our antibiotic drug discovery to the next level. Can you find uh, an investor for us? I said, you're coming to me because you want an Indian investor. And they said, yes. And I said to them, I'm, I don't think I'm going to get an Indian company to be able to, in, to invest 20 million for you to do trials in this country or in Europe. What I will, what I will find is a top quali quality Indian biotech or pharmaceutical company that will invest in the uh, clinical research program in India and get the results which you wish for in this country and they may only spend 2 million or 3 million pounds in that particular process. That became the start of a, uh, a mindset change between the UK uh, company, who had never even thought of looking at outsourcing, and there I use that phrase outsourcing, <coughs> but a genuine collaboration at a high end scientific level. When I took Sir Anthony out the first time, he was very skeptical. I said, don't judge a book by its cover. As he scratched the surface, he said, their clinical trials are world class. Their microbiology is world class. Their formulation is world class. Today, uh, the company in India, Capital Pharmaceuticals, is building a whole wing for research and development named the Sir Anthony. But into third countries, and in particular, uh, countries in Africa, where the UK has interests, and India too has interests, and if it doesn't, it better well have interests because of uh, the uh, encroachment of uh, our, our big neighbor as well on that continent, and I visit Africa quite, quite frequently, where there is that uh, sense that they're waiting for India to also come on to that particular stage, and I believe through the capital that the city of London can contribute, the talent that India can contribute, the joint innovation that we can provide solutions for, uh, for Africa. For instance, let us look at the Chandan Yodna, which the uh, United Nations and the World Bank are now looking at rolling out in uh, various other parts of the world, and how can the UK, with its financial services muscle uh, and strength, and some of you may work for city firms uh, after your studies, uh, and India's um, social enterprise as far as uh, the gender and the financial inclusion program could work as well. And finally on third countries, uh, uh, you have all heard of the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth of Nations, that club, that's a special club which actually uh, is the third largest trading club in the world, and um, uh, which is often missed uh, uh, missed out by India, and I think India is relegated, or you know, it wasn't in the manifesto of the BJP uh, as well. I personally believe that India should do uh, to the Commonwealth what the Board of Cricket Control of India has done to world cricket. We should take it over, because it's the time, this is the time where Africa and 
island states are looking for leadership, and I believe India, of course, with the help of the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and the other developed countries, can work on that as well. So those of you that are interested in looking at third countries and look at the Commonwealth as an, as an, uh, as an example of where you may wish to focus some of your thoughts and energies. Now, finally, uh, I, I touched upon the diaspora, and I regard all of you in this room as part of that great Indian diaspora, where uh, Prime Minister Modi has said that he has uh, 25 million ambassadors to the world, and uh, each one of us, in some way or other, is an ambassador for uh, our country of birth, or our country of uh, inspiration, our country of origin. And each one of us has a, a role to play, and I believe that that role transcends uh, uh, politics, it transcends policy, because what actually moves governments to do things is not the policies or the politics, but it is people. And each one of us, I believe, has an opportunity to be those real bridge builders, having benefited, some of you may not think that you benefit from a UK education, but uh, I'm sure you will in, in, in the years to come. And how can you, in your small way, become part of India's globalization and, and UK's uh, uh, ambitions to remain squarely behind the UK's growth, India's growth trajectory? So with those words, uh, uh, again, uh, I thank the Warwick India Forum for inviting me and uh, for all of you uh, listening so uh, patiently. Sorry I didn't have a PowerPoint or any videos or slides. I thought I'd get back straight down to business. Uh, and economics, but thank you all very, very much. We've got time for a quick couple of questions, so anyone? Nothing on politics, please. <laughs> um, my name is Arvind. I politics ah. <laughs> you had mentioned Pakistan and India. Half my family went to Pakistan, half my family remained in India, and I'm quite proud to be a Muslim in India. But my cousin, who I've never met, became my roommate at Warwick University, and she was a Muslim. I never met her before, and she just turned out your cousin. She hated me, I loved her. <laughs> but now, sadly, she's in Pakistan, and I'm here, and I'll go wherever I can be of service to my country and to, to people everywhere. But I feel the UK can be that catalyst for change. We're all young people here, we all have problems, we all want employment, we all want opportunities, we're all, we're all entrepreneurial in our own ways. How can you, or me, or all of us, be that change, that engineer for change that the Prime Minister keeps talking about? And congratulations on your campaign. Thank you very much. I think um, in, in my remarks I, uh, I gave four or five different examples of how thinking outside the box and trying to connect the dots actually uh, does that and uh, um, you know I, I remember this one uh, story that was told to me many years ago of, of, a, uh, of a, a barren piece of land uh, in South Africa where uh, uh, a family lived and they used to farm on that land and then there was a, a drought and they they missed you know they, they, for three or four years they were, first they were the, one of the richest families in the region and then they became one of the poorest and they were barely able to survive they had to sell that piece of land and move away because um, for whatever little they could earn for food. So they sold that piece of land. A few years later, they revisited that place and it was a, a massive, massive mansion uh, with lots of people working on there and uh, a most picturesque site. So they knocked upon the door of the person that they bought and said, look, this is a barren piece of land. We thought there was nothing here. And they said, well, the problem, the mistake you made is that you looked up and you looked down and you looked left and you looked right. You didn't look beneath you because beneath you there's a diamond mine. Mm -hmm. And right under our feet and in this auditorium and this university and you know, the education that you guys are enjoying and the contacts that you're making, including the people here, take their cards, take their email address, badger them. These are the sorts of people that will give you that one break or that idea. That's what you've got to do, network as much as possible as well. Hi, um, my name is Ruben Kaur and I'm a scientist at the University of Oxford. So coming to your clinical trial question, um, while being a scientist I'm very pro-clinical trials, but I'm also aware that clinical trials proceed to the trial stage without sometimes a lot of backing up or due diligence. And I'm very skeptical of allowing India or Indians to be guinea pigs 
for a trial stage just because it's cheaper or it's easier to get through the review process? I'm, I'm very skeptical. Um, uh, I'll, I'll answer that question. Uh, from the limited uh, observations and due diligence is something that's important to me as a, both as a former lawyer and somebody that sits on uh, a board that's responsible for uh, ensuring that uh, the governance is up to uh, scratch. Yes, it is cheaper in, in India, but um, uh, you know, well, international companies will not just go to India because it's cheaper. They'll go to India because of, and I mentioned the points in quality and world class. For instance, there are mo more FDA uh, monitored sites uh, in, in India than in, the, uh, than in the United States. MHRA and the facilities that I uh, can, you know, have, have visited, the, the, uh, the UK's regulator, uh, is continuously monitoring and uh, these, Indian uh, these Indian pharmaceutical companies are continuously under the radar uh, by the US regulators, by the US, UK regulators, by the European Union regulators. Yes, occasionally there may be operations, and I do fully, fully, fully sympathize that Indians should not, and I've blogged about this, should not be cheap guinea, uh, guinea pigs. But if, if, if you get the right uh, balance and the consciousness and, and the ethical framework, India is the place to be. But I, I fully sympathize with what you're saying. Uh, one, two more questions. As students of PR, my, I, my friend and I were discussing about job opportunities. And when we think about the world of PR, New York and London are obviously the more exciting things to be. But with the last political campaign that we saw, I think it has raised the bar in the country. So thank you for that, first of all. Which last, but not the Delhi one. <laughs> I wasn't there for that one, so I wouldn't count that. Uh, but we just wanted to know, uh, how do you see the role of PR evolving in the coming five years? Not later than that. Uh, five years in India, as far as both corporate and politics is concerned, and even entertainment, actually, Bollywood. <laughs> See, India is the most fascinating place as far as uh, communications and messaging is concerned. Um, a, a simple phrase like, uh, uh, yeah, right thing, hey, what is that, what is that, the Coca-Cola uh, at the year, probably well before your time. That <laughs> um, one message, having across different, uh, uh, different um, language barriers, different uh, uh, cultural uh, and different nuances, to be able to get that one ad messaging absolutely right is a skill. You know, achedim, to get that uh, absolutely right, you've got, and, and for it to resonate across the country is something that, you know, you've got to live and breathe India, you've got to travel, you've got to be part and parcel of that uh, process. And I don't think that it's going to in any way diminish what you're going to see it, it is not only more and more innovation in advertising and in VR and of course in, 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 in the film industry, but I see the whole world looking at India as well as a place again to seek their ideas and their suggestions and you know, not only to outsource but to actually uh, see, um, to source ideas from, not about looking at ideas elsewhere but to actually go to India, uh, in, India for uh, in, in, in innovative solutions. You know, my, my corporate law background, I, I always say that at the end of the day, if I, I wanted to negotiate a deal, uh, I, I'd, put, uh, I'd hire a team of Indian lawyers because of the, the way in which they're so innovative in getting through different uh, hurdles as well. So, um, we put a, for India's PR to grow, India's PR industry needs to market itself a lot better. I'd like to just pick up the, the point that you made um, about the importance of the depth of... Ah! <laughs> the depth uh, of... I'm trying to look for an Indian accent there. Um, <laughs> well, that's partly why I'm asking the question, yes. really. Um, because I want to pick up the point you made about the depth of the relationship, really. Um, I'm just here as a member of the community. That's, I, I simply came earlier in the week to something else at Warwick, and... Um, bought a ticket. Um, now one of the things that, that I just really do want to say to you is that I've been immensely impressed by the day, profoundly impressed by the gifts and abilities of all of you sitting around here. But what it's reminded me of, and what your talk just now reminded me of, as a young student myself many years ago, not at Warwick, um, I had the privilege of going to um, a conference about world citizenship. 
that conference, when I was probably about 20, had and continues to have an immense influence on me. It shaped the way that I see the world. And really what I'm wanting to say to all of you is that I do hope that the opportunities that you've had here at Warwick and the experiences that you've had, or elsewhere of course, um, continue to shape the way that you think and the way that you live wherever you are for the rest of your life until you get at least as old as me um, and hopefully longer because that's what makes me feel profoundly hopeful um, as a result of today and I want to say thank you. So your name is? Uh, Pranav Logan. I'm a student at Oxford University. I'm just uh, here to comment. Um, you mentioned the Indian diaspora. And um, I was wondering if the government always makes a big, the Indian government always makes a big deal about getting diaspora involved in India. And now, in a couple months after making a decision, I've been in America for 15 years, but I still have my Indian citizenship. And I can't keep both the Indian citizenship and get US citizenship. So if in order to make in order to make me an uh, American citizen, I have to give up my Indian citizenship. So, why not let the government pursue the option of allowing Indians to have dual citizenship? Why is that not, that not a discussion that's being? Well, it certainly is a discussion, and I'm the first uh, advocate of uh, dual citizenship, and I'd like to see it. Um, uh, in my lifetime, uh, uh, definitely, but you know, it's, it is. It, it is a vortex to uh, issues uh, those in government have grappled with. The, the, the root is the OCI, the Overseas Citizen of India route, which gets you close there. But you can't vote these guys in or out of power. That's the, that's the downside of it all. But uh, um, look, any, any further suggestions or ideas or start those petitions and whatever, we've got to keep that issue uh, alive and we'll have to find out ways in which to get that um, real cement. But OCI is pretty much uh, uh, you know, almost there. Uh, in, in any case, but, um, I'm with you on that. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>